Part One of The Defenders. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Defenders by Philip K. Dick. Part One. Taylor sat back in his chair reading the morning newspaper. The warm kitchen and the smell of coffee blended with the comfort of not having to go to work. This was his rest period, the first for a long time, and he was glad of it. He folded the second section back, sighing with contentment. "'What is it?' Mary said from the stove. "'They pasted Moscow again last night.' Taylor nodded his head in approval. "'Gave it a real pounding. One of those R.H. bombs. It's about time.' He nodded again, feeling the full comfort of the kitchen, the presence of his plump, attractive wife, the breakfast dishes and coffee. This was relaxation. And the war news was good, good and satisfying. He could feel a justifiable glow at the news, a sense of pride and personal accomplishment. After all, he was an integral part of the war program, not just another factory worker lugging a cart of scrap but a technician, one of those who designed and planned the nerve trunk of the war. It says they have the new subs almost perfected. Wait till they get those going. He smacked his lips with anticipation. When they start shelling from underwater, the Soviets are sure going to be surprised. They're doing a wonderful job, Mary agreed vaguely. Do you know what we saw today? Our team is getting a leddy to show to the schoolchildren. I saw the leddy, but only for a moment. It's good for the children to see what their contributions are going for, don't you think?" She looked around at him. A leddy, Taylor murmured. He put the newspaper slowly down. Well, make sure it's decontaminated properly. We don't want to take any chances. Oh, they always bathe them when they're brought down from the surface, Mary said. They wouldn't think of letting them down without the bath, would they?" She hesitated, thinking back. Don, you know it makes me remember. He nodded. I know. He knew what she was thinking. Once in the very first weeks of the war, before everyone had been evacuated from the surface, they had seen a hospital train discharging the wounded, people who had been showered with sleet. He remembered the way they had looked, the expression on their faces or as much of their faces as was left. It was not a pleasant sight. There had been a lot of that at first, in the early days before the transfer to undersurface was complete. There had been a lot, and it hadn't been very difficult to come across it. Taylor looked up at his wife. She was thinking too much about it the last few months. They all were. Forget it, he said. It's all in the past. There isn't anybody up there now but the leddies, and they don't mind. But just the same, I hope they're careful when they let one of them down here. If one were still hot, he laughed, pushing himself away from the table. Forget it. I'll be home for the next two shifts. Nothing to do but sit around and take things easy. Maybe we can take in a show, okay? A show? Uh, do we have to? I don't like to look at all the destruction, the ruins. Sometimes I see some places I remember, like San Francisco. They showed a shot of San Francisco, the bridge broken and fallen in the water, and I get upset. I don't like to watch. But don't you want to know what's going on? No human beings are getting hurt, you know. But it's so awful. Her face was set and strained. Please, no, Don. Don Taylor picked up his newspaper sullenly. All right, but there isn't a hell of a lot else to do. And don't forget, their cities are getting it even worse. She nodded. Taylor turned the rough, thin sheets of newspaper. His good mood had soured on him. Why did she have to fret all the time? They were perfectly well off as things went. You couldn't expect to have everything perfect, living under surface, with an artificial sun and artificial food. Naturally it was a strain, not seeing the sky, or being able to go any place or see anything other than metal walls, great roaring factories, the plant yards, barracks. But it was better than being on surface, and some day it would end and they could return, 
Nobody wanted to live this way, but it was necessary. He turned the page angrily, and the poor paper ripped. Damn it! The paper was getting worse quality all the time. Bad print, yellow tint. Well, they needed everything for the war program. He ought to know that. Wasn't he one of the planners? He excused himself and went into the other room. The bed was still unmade. They had better get it in shape before the seventh hour inspection. There was a one-unit fine. The vidphone rang. He halted. Who could it be? He went over and clicked it on. Taylor, the voice said, forming into place. It was an old face, gray and grim. This is Moss. I'm sorry to bother you during rest period, but this thing has come up. He rattled papers. I want you to hurry over here. Taylor stiffened. What is it? There's no chance he could wait. The calm gray eyes were studying him, expressionless, unjudging. If you want me to come down to the lab, Taylor grumbled, I suppose I can. I'll get my uniform. No, uh, come as you are. And not to the lab. Meet me at second stage as soon as possible. It'll take you about a half hour, using the fast car up. I'll see you there. The picture broke and Moss disappeared. What was it? Mary said at the door. Moss, he wants me for something. I knew this would happen. Well, you didn't want to do anything anyhow. What does it matter? His voice was bitter. It's all the same every day. I'll bring you back something. I'm going up to second stage. Maybe I'll be close enough to the surface to— Don't! Don't bring me anything, not from the surface. All right, I won't. But of all the irrational nonsense— She watched him put on his boots without answering. Moss nodded, and Taylor fell in step with him as the older man strode along. A series of loads were going up to the surface, blind cars clanking like ore trucks up the ramp, disappearing through the stage trap above them. Taylor watched the cars, heavy with tubular machinery of some sort, weapons new to him. Workers were everywhere, in the dark gray uniforms of the labor corps, loading, lifting, shouting back and forth. The stage was deafening with noise. We'll go up away, Moss said, where we can talk. This is no place to give you details. They took an escalator up. The commercial lift fell behind them, and with it most of the crashing and booming. Soon they emerged on an observation platform, suspended on the side of the tube, the vast tunnel leading to the surface, not more than half a mile above them now. My God, Taylor said, looking down the tube involuntarily, it's a long way down. Moss laughed. Don't look. They opened a door and entered an office. Behind the desk an officer was sitting, an officer of internal security. He looked up. I'll be right with you, Moss. He gazed at Taylor, studying him. You're a little ahead of time. This is Commander Franks, Moss said to Taylor. He was the first to make the discovery. I was notified last night. He tapped a parcel he carried. I was let in because of this. Franks frowned at him and stood up. We're going up to first stage. We can discuss it there. First stage? Taylor repeated nervously. The three of them went down a side passage to a small lift. I've never been up there. Is it all right? It's not radioactive, is it? You're like everyone else, Frank said, old women afraid of burglars. No radiation leaks down to first stage. There's lead and rock, and what comes down the tube is bathed. What's the nature of the problem? Taylor asked. I'd like to know something about it. In a moment. They entered the lift and ascended. When they stepped out, they were in a hall of soldiers, weapons and uniforms everywhere. Taylor blinked in surprise. So this was first stage, the closest undersurface level to the top. After this stage there was only rock, lead, and rock, and the great tubes leading up like the burrows of earthworms. Lead and rock, and above that, where the tubes opened, the great expanse that no living being had seen for eight years. The vast, endless ruin that had once been man's home, the place where he had lived eight years ago. Now the surface was a lethal desert of slag and rolling clouds. Endless clouds drifted back and forth, blotting out the red sun. 
Occasionally something metallic stirred, moving through the remains of a city, threading its way across the tortured terrain of the countryside. A leady, a surface robot, immune to radiation, constructed with feverish haste in the last months before the Cold War became literally hot. Leadys, crawling along the ground, moving over the oceans or through the skies, in slender blackened craft, creatures that could exist where no life could remain, metal and plastic figures that waged a war man had conceived, but which he could not fight himself. Human beings had invented war, invented and manufactured the weapons, even invented the players, the fighters, the actors of the war, but they themselves could not venture forth, could not wage it themselves. In all the world, in Russia, in Europe, America, Africa, no living human being remained. They were under the surface, in the deep shelters that had been carefully planned and built, even as the first bombs began to fall. It was a brilliant idea, and the only idea that could have worked. Up above, on the ruined, blasted surface of what had once been a living planet, the leady crawled and scurried and fought man's war. And under surface, in the depths of the planet, human beings toiled endlessly to produce the weapons to continue the fight, month by month, year by year. First stage, Taylor said. A strange ache went through him, almost to the surface, but not quite, Moss said. Franks led them through the soldiers, over to one side, near the lip of the tube. In a few minutes a lift will bring something down to us from the surface, he explained. You see, Taylor, every once in a while security examines and interrogates a surface leady, one that has been above for a time to find out certain things. A vid call is sent up and contact is made with the field headquarters. We need this direct interview. We can't depend on vid-screen contact alone. The leadys are doing a good job, but we want to make certain that everything is going the way we want it." Franks faced Taylor and Moss and continued, "'The lift will bring down a leady from the surface, one of the A-class leadys. There's an examination chamber in the next room, with a lead wall in the center, so the interviewing officers won't be exposed to radiation. We find this easier than bathing the leady. It is going right back up. It has a job to get back to. Two days ago an A-class leady was brought down and interrogated. I conducted the session myself. We were interested in a new weapon the Soviets had been using, an automatic mine that pursues anything that moves. Military had sent instructions up that the mine be observed and reported in detail. The A-class leady was brought down with information. We learned a few facts from it obtained the usual roll of film and reports, and then sent it back up. It was going out of the chamber back to the lift when a curious thing happened. At the time I thought Franks broke off, a red light was flashing. That downlift is coming, he nodded to some soldiers. Let's enter the chamber. The leady will be along in a moment. An A-class leady, Taylor said. I've seen them on the show screens making their reports. It's quite an experience, Moss said. They're almost human. End of Part One